Can we say I told you so? The Marvel machine was unstoppable. Phases 1 through 3 did not have a single failure, but then they had to mess with a good thing. They went woke, then went broke. It's certainly no surprise to me, as the cracks started to form with the beginning of Phase 4. The Black Widow movie horribly underperformed. They did race swapping and gender swapping of characters, not just in Black Widow but other movies, which did not please the majority of fans, but that wasn't their worst sin. They had already killed the character off in Avengers Endgame. Now, people who read comic books know that death isn't necessarily the end. They killed Superman and brought him back. They killed Alfred the butler and brought him back. They killed Aunt May every four months and kept bringing her back. Not really, I'm being facetious. But the average filmgoer, who isn't into comics, doesn't realize that. So, even though the film was well made, it tanked at the box office. Of course, everyone back then was blaming the pandemic lockdown, which I believe is bogus, and, since Spider-Man No Way Home, that can't be used as an excuse. As Adam Post observed, other problems currently plaguing the juggernaut superhero franchise are bad writing, sloppy CGI and visual effects, and a huge number of projects across film and television being churned out, making it harder for the average viewer to keep up with the content. Wokeness or the woke agenda has certainly affected the box office numbers of almost all recent MCU projects. Films like Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, Thor, Love and Thunder, and Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, have not even come close to making a billion dollars and have faced significant drops at the box office, despite having strong opening weekends. We've already discussed Black Widow, but let's look at the other films in Phase 4. Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings grossed $224.5 million in the United States and Canada, and $207.7 million in other territories, for a worldwide total of $432.2 million. Personally, I think this movie did well with that box office. Shang-Chi is not a character that's well known outside of the Marvel Comics fanbase. People outside of geek fandom know Spider-Man and Captain America, but not Shang-Chi as much. But even though it did the box office I thought it should do, the studio wasn't too happy with those numbers. Now let's look at The Eternals. The Eternals was plagued with poor direction, poor pacing, weak acting and isn't anywhere near as smart as it thinks it is. I don't believe having gay characters helped it much. But even if they left out that one scene, I don't think it would have improved the box office either. Its total take was 402.1 million nationally and worldwide. Then we come to the one true success story in Spider-Man No Way Home. This film was completely free from any woke political crap and did justice to the characters. It stayed true to what the fans wanted to see in a superhero movie, had good acting, and pleased three generations of Spider-Man fans. It destroyed the idea that people were staying away because of the pandemic and disproves the idea that superhero films are dead. If you build it, they will come, if you build it right, that is. But this wasn't made by Disney, it was made by Sony and Disney only got a cut of the grosses. It grossed $814.1 million in the United States and Canada, and $1.108 billion in other territories for a worldwide total of $1.922 billion. Then we come to Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. Why this WandaVision movie is called that, I don't know. This film is clearly a sequel to the WandaVision TV series, Strange is a side character in his own movie. I have nothing against strong female leads, but if it's going to be a WandaVision movie, then call it that. It did decent box office, but I feel that the true star of this movie is director Sam Raimi, who brought success to all three Tobey Maguire Spider-Mans, even the much maligned third entry into that series, which was the biggest box office success of the three, they should bring back Raimi to the Spider-Verse. I also didn't like the character of Wanda, as presented here. She wants to reunite with Billy and Tommy. But she kills way too many people and I found her character to not be sympathetic in any way because of the death she caused. I did not care for the character and her resolution was underwhelming to me. Its box office was 955.8 million worldwide. Thor Love and Thunder sees our favorite Norse god back for a fourth time, so far, the only one that has returned for a fourth movie. But now he's been subverted as his love interest, Jane Foster, wields Mjolnir. However, I didn't really mind this. Thor doesn't take a back seat to Milady and gets a new badass weapon his own self. He definitely doesn't play second fiddle to Jane. The problems here are a weak plot, no real stakes or consequences, and, even though it's fun to watch, a lot like Batman Forever, it just doesn't go anywhere. Its total worldwide box office was 761 million. The final film of Phase 4 was Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. The biggest problem, of course, was the death of the franchise star, Chadwick Boseman. But they failed to recast the character and just killed him off. 
Despite being killed and reborn in the first movie, some believe the character should have been recast, including Boseman's brother Derek, who said the actor felt that the character was bigger than any one person. How would you feel if they recasted T'Challa? I would have been fine with it because Chad was not him and he wasn't Chad. You know, Chad was Chad was Chad. T'Challa is just the character. As George Vuderitz's over at CBR points out, Angela Bassett delivered a fantastic performance in Wakanda Forever, but her character was a bit of a hypocrite. When Queen Ramonda addresses the United Nations, she makes it very clear that her country will not share its vibranium with the world because they do not trust other countries with it. In Black Panther, Killmonger planned to wage war on the entire planet, and he was going to do so with the help of vibranium weapons and technology that he acquired after becoming king of Wakanda. As valid as her point may have been, Wakanda is just as much of a threat with vibranium as everyone else. Neymar is a skilled fighter, but he is not very smart. He warned Queen Ramonda that Wakanda would be attacked if she refused to help him, and he followed through with that threat. In doing so, he attacked Ramonda and caused her death. As Shuri rushes to her mother's side, Neymar announces that he will return to Wakanda in one week with his full army and that he will destroy the country if they do not side with him. The idea that Wakanda would become his ally after such an attack is comical, and by giving them a week, he provided them with enough time to devise an effective counteroffensive. I also want to point out that Tenek Huerta Mejia is incredibly weak as Neymar, the Submariner. The pacing was uneven and the story, though solid, just wasn't epic enough for this kind of a film. So, Phase 4 ended with a 858.5 million worldwide whimper. It didn't lose money, but it didn't make anywhere near what the studio wanted it to. Now we're into Phase 5, and the first film, the most important one in the phase, Ant-Man and the Wasp Contaminium, may not make what the Eternals did. Is the MCU dead? Maybe not, but it sure has lost its focus. It needs to get back to basics and give the fans what they want. Maybe a well-made Fantastic Four movie anyone? That was the show for today. What do you think? Do you agree that the MCU has lost focus? What can they do to regain box office gold? Is the MCU dead? What was your favorite MCU movie? Let me know in the comments section below. If you like this type of programming, subscribe to my channel and click the bell to stay informed of upcoming shows. Also, check out my Carl Vincent Vampire Hunter franchise in the comments section, and, until next time, this is Kevin Gibbon saying live long and prosper, may the force be with you, and keep reaching for the stars.